everybody. Thanks for joining in. This is APFA National President Lori Bassani. I wanted to come to you guys today because I've gotten a lot of messages in the last couple of days and a lot of concerns and many members have asked me to address some issues of concern out there for the members and the last thing we need right now is division and um, people that are upset and things that are going around out there that may not be factual so I'm here you can ask me anything this is ask me anything live any questions you have I will answer um, I do want to give you a little update though because we've had a very very busy last couple of days yesterday we uh, reignited the coalition of flight attendant unions every single flight attendant union had a representative there uh, they were very grateful we had a whole day of meetings and we touched on many many issues that are near and dear to all of our flight attendants and the whole profession and some great things came from it we're going to actually have a national lobby day a fly-in for all flight attendants from all unions and that's going to happen at a date to be term determined next year our next meeting is going to be hosted by um, IAM and of course we hosted this one so that was we had a very very good day speaking about issues that are major concern to us such as fume events uh, our key keynote speaker came from London she's a doctor she's very very well versed in fume events and uh, it was a very very interesting speech that top of our list the health of our flight attendants uh, the other things that we talked about we shared notes in negotiations many of the other uh, flight attendant unions are in negotiations and bargaining and it was very interesting to share what's going on at the different carriers and the different unions today we had media day we had media from uh, the Associated Press we had Bloomberg we had WFAA TV 8 here in Dallas um, Dallas Morning News Dallas Biz Business Journal and a few other media outlets came to talk to us about these very same issues so we were very pleased that a lot of people came and uh, we haven't had a media day in a very very long time as you know we've been in negotiations for a year now some of you have asked why did we go into early negotiations well that was a provision that was negotiated in our contract for the very reason that either side could trigger that we decided that for us it was best to trigger it early why because it's taken a whole year to get to the bottom, I guess the bottom third of our contract. And by that, I don't mean these are important issues, but none of those issues touch scheduling or any compensation related issues. But I have a great team and we have opened about a third of our contract. We already have six PAs. So we're doing well there. We haven't gotten into the nitty gritty yet. What you can look forward to is a scheduling survey probably by the end of November. And we're hoping early next year to begin negotiating these scheduling issues in our contract. Of course, the last thing that we always negotiate is compensation related issues. And those are always the hardest and the stickiest and the thorniest and the ones that mat matter quite a bit to, of course, our whole membership. So I wanted to give you that update. And with that, I'm ready to take any questions. Uh, go ahead and start. There, all right there. Okay, Jamie Robinson, after you and Liz made a terrible Okay, what are we taught? Where's the question on that? Cannot trust you and those who have brought different skin color than you the budget and to make the budget and to make good decisions. Jamie Robinson. I think what you're probably talking about is an issue that's very sensitive. This happened at our headquarters. As you know, we run a staff of 13 UAW represented employees and that staff is very important. One of our jobs besides being the president, the vice president, the treasurer, or the national secretary of the union is to manage our staff and to manage this building that we have here in Euless, Texas. There has been an issue and it's of a confidential nature. However, I think it's important because these are a lot of the questions that I was getting today from you guys. You probably want to know what exactly happened. What I have is a staff that I'm going to protect no matter what. It's very important. We must provide a safe and hostile free workplace for our employees just like what we expect when we're on the airplane we would never take an airplane up in the air that was either not safe to take up or that we felt that there might be a passenger on board that could harm someone or that could possibly be very disruptive on that flight so with that I think that's what you're talking about and I appreciate the question next Danica Bach she just made a statement about behavior thank you Danica for weighing in Emma Dare, Bean Hill, no one is here to listen about fume events. Well, that's too bad. It's a very, very important issue for many of our 
flight attendants. In fact, we have crew members that are so incapacitated that they cannot fly right now. That's a very, very important issue for our crews. And I hope that many of you that are affected appreciate the fact that we're definitely, not only are we focusing on that issue, but we're asking American Airlines to do what they can to put the, uh, put the Paul, I think they're called converters on the airplanes that filter that toxic air. So thank you for that. Why didn't we sue Boeing? Oh, why didn't we sue Boeing? That's a good question. That question actually came up today by one of the uh, media. I think it was the uh, TV WFA8. Um, we're not going to sue Boeing because actually we have other airplanes that we can fly. The, we had some flight attendants affected by scheduling, but they didn't lose flying. Like, so let's say Southwest, that's pretty much their only airplane. So luckily we have other aircraft and we're able to still fly our schedules and we won't be suing Boeing. Thank you for that. It's the next one. What happened with the ex-officers pay, payments back to the union? Am I still on because the screen is black? Yeah, you're still on. Okay. Um, well, we've been asking for them to pay it back. The first thing that we did when we found out that there was a discrepancy, it's, it's our duty and in fact, with the Department of Labor, it's very important that when we find discrepancies like that, we must report them. We did report them right away to our board. And uh, what happened was after that, we had an investigation to make sure that those claims were true. And we did find a discrepancy in the ways that the payouts for three of our national officers were figured. They were calculated in a manner that was not consistent with our policy manual. And in, for that reason, we had to bring that to our board of directors. Of course, our board of directors, it is up to them to act on that. And they wanted more time because the uh, three former officers wanted more time to substantiate those calculations. And the board did give that to them. We then had another special board meeting to address that just that issue. And it was addressed. Actually, a resolution was passed directing those officers to uh, repay the union the extra payments that they had received. Um, after that time, we sent a demand letter, and a couple of weeks later, we sent another demand letter. So that's where it is right now, and it will, of course, be up to the board to take any action should they not receive payment. And thank you for that question. Anthony? Well, why are non-FAs allowed to join the APFA Facebook page? Oh, Namely, well. Mercy Dunaway's husband. It's a, it's a public page, and there's a reason why we can't have a closed page, and I'll have to defer to um, Anthony for that. It's a public page. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's just a public it's page. It's a public page. There's nothing we can do. There's, I guess there's nothing we can do about that because it's a public page. I wish it was just closed to flight attendants, but that's not possible. And you're right. We get a lot of trolls on that page, and uh, you know there they are, but we have to go through all of that just to have this page. And we hope that the information that we are sharing on that page is important to you. Uh, there's a lot of talk of APFA being bankrupt. True or false? Oh gosh, no. APFA is not bankrupt. What has happened though, and I did send you a hotline recently, what has happened is that our costs have increased exponentially. While our dues haven't been raised since 2002, does that mean we're going to raise dues? No, not at all. We think that it's our responsibility right now to cut in the ways that we can cut, but still keep the members, keep the services that we have for our members and make sure that we have a very smooth and, and well-running machine here at APFA. In fact, we're in the process of doing that right now and we'll be reporting out to you what that process is going to be, but I guarantee you we're not bankrupt. In fact, our negotiations fund is one of the healthiest in the whole industry. Thanks for that question. Um, Grab some water. Why do we have UAW staff members? <clears throat> great, that's a great question. Why do we have UAW staff members? It might interest a lot of you to know that most unions, you know, we have buildings that we operate. We have people that need to do the administration work of the uh, union. And most unions, probably all unions, have staff that are belong in another union. In fact, I did some work for Southwest um, Airlines flight attendants a few years ago, and they only had one clerical worker at that time. They were a smaller airline at that time. And uh, she actually went on strike, and she withheld, she withheld making cookies for them. It was, it was pretty cute. But she was in a union. So um, our staff is UAW, and they were organized back in the 80s. So thank you for that question. A lot of our staff, we have longtime workers here that have been here for uh, some of them over 30 years. So they've been here for quite a while. We have an excellent staff, and we, 
we very much enjoy working with them. What's um, next? Uh, Kristen says, do not cut departments that FAs want to keep. You work for us. Uh, well, actually, we all we all work for the union. We, we are we are the union, not just us, but you are as well. We try to keep every single service that we can for our flight attendants. We are one of the unions that provide a lot of services where some unions don't provide the service that we do. And there's a reason for that. There are two models for unions. One is a one is an organizing model and one is a service model. We're a service model, obviously. You don't see us out there organizing other groups. Although we can do that, and we might do that in the future, it is a way to bring in uh, more cash. So thank you for that question. Uh, what is a union doing about, mop, about the mafia with the trips? Oh, the cartels. If you're on, so we've had a couple of town halls lately where we have discussed this. At our last meeting with the company, um, actually at our last board of directors meeting, we invited the company in to give an update on what they're doing about the cartels. And they are in their second phase of uh, investigating and they will be calling more flight attendants in that have what they're calling suspicious bidding or pickup drop behavior. So they're in the second phase and uh, it, it's very active right now. Um, so you're a career union worker. When was the last time you flown and do you intend on flying again? Ooh, that's a great question. I'm not a career union worker. Actually, um, of course, I started out as a flight attendant and that's what I came to this job for. I love this job and one of the reasons why I got involved with the union work was right after the, well, was at the strike. I volunteered my, uh, my time and my skills for the strike, I was up in Seattle, Washington. That was my base, and that was closed right after 9-11. But I thought it was very worthwhile to go ahead and lend my, my abilities and skills, which were in uh, public relations and organizing. And I organized our people up there, and it was great. After that, I had no no desires at all to be in union work. I had, a, I had been doing uh, actually concerts and things like that. However, there came a need for a vice chair we, it's a vice president now, and then I moved up to uh, president of Seattle. From there, there's a lot. I did a lot of other things, and then I took an 11-year break, which was much needed, and I came back as president to see what I could do because so much has happened in our industry, and we have so much to do to bring ourselves back up to where we were back before I left the last time. So thanks for that question. Uh, what is this war room that we hear and see photos of? Ooh, wait a minute, that's secret. We can't talk about that because the company might be listening in right now. But you're welcome to come to headquarters and we'll be happy to show it to you. Um, the company has a war room and what they have in their war room is a way to watch all of our social media. Yes, they monitor it. And why wouldn't they? It's a really smart strategy, isn't it? So just remember that anything you put on social media, the company probably sees it before we do. and. Uh, so we have a war room. Of course we do. We're in negotiations. Um, tough one. If we are the union, why aren't we privy to the details about what happened with Eric? Uh, if the police are called to our union headquarters, dues payers should be given details. Ooh, I think dues payers you know, deserve a lot. One thing you deserve is our services for your dues. Uh, internal matters are internal. The police actually were not called to our headquarters. Um, luckily, the problem that we had departed the the location and we didn't have to call any police to the headquarters. I'll tell you something though, it's, it's our responsibility and our duty to make sure that this building and everyone who's working in it is safe and we will do what we need to do to make sure that we create a safe and hostile free work environment for all of our workers. That's extremely important. I thank you for that question. Why did you hide the 110 I guess, our raise for months from the membership. Why do you all get purser and premium pays when some aren't even purser or able to hold premiums? That's going to be, now that's not something that I decided. You know, I've been president for a little over a year. That would be something, probably a question for the board. The board uh, is in charge of all the policy for our union. They, uh, they, run, they run most everything in the union. So those questions would need to be directed to them as far as when it started. But what they do is how they budget trip removals is they budget each department on what they call a trip removal amount. And so that includes, in case they have someone in that department that has all of those qualifications, how they budget them is at the very top of the pay scale and for all of the different premiums. And that way they don't come under budget. Um, why is the union going downhill? Isn't it your duty and responsibility to unite this group? Why are there so many 
hash hash issues that you can't address. I'm not sure what hash hash means, but I can address trying to get unity in this group. Actually, when I was campaigning and when I first came on board, that was one of the most important questions. And I know that many of you are very sincere with that question. How are you going to unify us? Well, the way that I tried to do it, and I'm not sure if it worked, but the way that I tried to do it was to make sure that here at APFA headquarters and all of the people that serve you, I drew from many different uh, airlines, from backgrounds from different unions, different age groups from you know very, very junior to very senior, different levels of uh, knowledge and skill, uh, of course, different races and many, many diverse um, you know, genders and er everything. So also from my, the legacy side of LUS and the legacy side of LAA, I have appointed in my national departments a very nice combination of those. And anybody that I have appointed have reflected the makeup and the demographics of our membership. And I'm telling you, it is difficult because the cultures are very, very different. It's something that I have learned since I have you know, brought these people together. But once you come together, flight attendants are flight attendants and they're very professional and it's done very well, but it is a gargantuan task unifying this group with all of the different types of uh, issues that we have out there. and. I'm not sure if I'm a miracle maker or a rainmaker, but I hope you guys will take heed that whatever you can do to unify the group, whether it's on the airplane or if you're in a picketing event, we really need to do that for negotiations this time around. I appreciate your efforts in doing that. And I'm going to plug the activist program because while you say that, we have a lot of people every day that are signing up as activists. And that shows me that they're interested and they're engaged and they want to have a good contract. And that's what we want. Uh, why was APFA completely ghost for the marches for rally for rest for the 10 hour rest bill? But now that other unions helped get it passed, all of a sudden APFA is involved. AA is the largest airline. Why can't APFA run businesses like the largest airline instead of always a second runner up? Well, I guess that's a matter of opinion, first of all. And it's, if you think if, if that's how you feel, of course, that's true to you and that's important. As far as a 10 hour rest, it didn't afford us that much more in our, in our contracts. But what we did was we focused on other things and every flight attendant group has a different focus sometimes because it depends on the makeup of their group. Rest is important for everybody. And we're definitely going to join with all of the other flight attendant unions in every issue that's important to all flight attendants. So I think I believe that it's always been important to us and now we're focusing on it just as much as everyone else is and we hope that you guys will come right along with us. Uh, in your email you said you called the police. What's the truth? Um, I never sent an email out. I think what you got was a private conversation, a private email that I sent that was meant only for the board of directors and the executive committee. And in that, what I did do is with well, I'll just be honest with you. Our staff was scared. And after the person left the building, I did contact the police and ask them to just be just be aware that there might perhaps be there perhaps might be a hostile worker situation. And I wanted them to be aware of it. However, I did not call them to the building or anything else of the sort. But for me, as the president of this building, I can't say strong enough how important it is that I protect the workers who are in this building and who have been longtime workers here. Why did you announce this event only 10 minutes before the start time to make the viewership low? Oh, I guess you found out one of my Achilles heels. I am a spur of the moment person. Just like picking up trips at the last minute, um, that's just what I do. We're so busy all day long and we've got so much to do. And today I said, hey, we've got a lot of emails coming in from my members and they're very concerned. And I think the best way to talk to them is through Facebook, all of them at the same time, so I can address their concerns. It takes a long time to answer all the emails. Sometimes you might get an answer at three in the morning and sometimes it might be a few days later. So I hope the people that need the answers are on today and are hearing them. Uh, why are you so afraid of Sarah Nelson? Nielsen? <laughs> it's Nelson. <laughs> Nelson. Um, well, I'm not afraid of Sarah Nelson. I'm sure she knows that as we've had several discussions. We've had dinner together and there's nothing to fear in either of us. I wish she would have made it to the coalition yesterday because uh, it was really nice to have everybody together again and we really enjoyed the, the good discussions that we had and it's going to help all of the unions and it would have been uh, nice to have her there and uh, 
So no, I think you're characterizing that wrong. There's nobody afraid of anybody here. Um, Let's get another question. Uh, do you believe PBS is a good system for us? Mm. Yes or no, and why? PBS uh, is really into details. Would yeah. this be included in negotiations? You mean whether or not? So PBS is here. It's here to stay. When I'm out there flying, I always ask everybody I see, "What do you think of PBS?" Um, I have gotten 99.9% .9 people saying they love PBS. What they don't like are some of the parts of it. They want more flexibility. They want more levels. I think there's ways that we can tweak this to make it a better system. Of course, the more senior people love it, and I think the more junior people do. Sometimes the people in the middle, they don't seem to be getting as much as what they want, and then the cartels are an issue there as well. But um, I would have never dreamed. Um, let me tell you, we went on strike over PBS back in 93. And I would have never dreamed that we would have to have PBS. And of course, it was snuck in on the bankruptcy contract. It wouldn't be here, I don't think, today had we not gone through the bankruptcy. But the in hindsight, and I will tell you that a lot of people seem to really like PBS. And like I said, what we plan on doing in negotiations is improving it. Uh, why are you cutting the budget of the contract and scheduling department? This is a very important department. And I believe the question I saw earlier uh, was why are all the departments getting cut except the orders? Ooh, well, that's first of all not factual. Um, and I'm not cutting any of the departments. We have a budget committee that is working on that as we speak, and uh, they will be letting us know what their uh, recommendations are, and we'll take it from there. We're not cutting, every department's going to be cut the same. So it's going to be across the board. I hope it's going to be across the board. Like I said, it's up to the budget committee, and then the board will accept those. Pr uh, proposals and of course the national officers but as far as I know right now everybody's being cut at a certain percentage and you will still be receiving the services that you get today Lori are you going to resign <laughs> <laughs> it no. keeps coming up <laughs> uh, no I'm not going to resign there's no reason for me to resign and I think that some of you may have jumped the gun and perhaps haven't heard all the facts of the situation Every president that's been on probably anywhere, whether it's in a union or for a country or for the United States of America, has been asked to resign. I don't intend on resigning. I'm going to be here. I'm going to stick it out, and I'm going to work hard for you, and that's what I'm here for, and I'm going to follow it through. Uh, sorry, some of these are quite lengthy. Um, if there are budgets being cut, why aren't we voting on what gets cut? Um, that's not a function of the membership. Um, in our constitution, the uh, the powers for that you can go to the board and the budget committee. Um, and you. remember, this happened. This has happened before. Right after the strike, we had to do this. There are many times in a union's history where you want to pull back. A lot of those times happen during negotiations because you want to have that money for negotiations. There's a lot we need to do. You never know how long negotiations is going to be. So if you can't forecast that, you want to make sure that you have a nice big bucket for negotiations, and we do. Um, Anthony's looking at your questions yeah, for me. Uh, why don't you find out from a quote leaked email about this? Uh, why yeah, are you, you not don't. being transparent with us? Well, that's why I'm here today. This is called transparency. And uh, I'm like I said, ask me anything. I'm here to ask answer any of your questions. I don't know who leaks those emails, but I will tell you it happened way before I came on board. And we do have leaks, well, big leaks. And there's no way I'm going to be able to stop them. The email that's out there that I wrote to the board and the executive committee was not meant for the membership, but I guess it spurred on this um, Ask Me Anything transparent Facebook call today, so it probably turned out pretty well. Um, a comment, anything that deals with, uh, she says, your union that we pay you, and this union is our right to vote. Mm -hmm. uh, I think they need to voice their opinion to their board. Wait, what was the question? I'm sorry. Uh, I think it comes down to why don't people get to vote on everything we do. Um, oh, hey, that's a really good question. Here's what you do get to vote on, dues increases. And here's an interesting little fact from my coalition meeting yesterday. I was really surprised. I asked one of the unions, you know, what their dues were for their members, their flight attendants, and it was $61. And she said it went up it, overnight. It went up $14. And they don't get to vote on that. So I... One great thing about this union and your voting is you can vote on that. You do get to vote. I think you're probably talking about the uh, 
bankruptcy contract that came about and the, you know it, it turns out yes and it turns out no and whatever but we're in a different time now section six is different you will get to vote on this contract and I hope all of you will vote if you're not current right now with your address or with your dues you need to be because it's going to be a very important contract not just for you guys but for all of your our whole profession we hope to have something that we can build on for every flight attendant um so what exactly did eric do um that is why we are here uh, we feel like you're giving us the runaround um I'm not here to talk about exactly what anybody did, and I'm not going to call anybody out by name. But I think you can tell by the answers that I've given that the most important thing to me here and the most important message for you today is that it's very important that we create, that we keep a hostile, free, and a safe work environment for our workers. And I would, if I was on an airplane, I would expect my captain to do the same thing. Right here, I'm, I'm the leader of this building, not just of all of you. And we have employees in here that need to be safe that have expressed very very strong feelings of not feeling safe and I will do everything in my power to keep them safe that is my job that's my responsibility and that's my duty and I would do that for every one of you um, someone said if a quarter of the membership can bid 110 hours our reserve guarantee should be a minimum of 85 uh, that's one of the things we're looking at in negotiations of course and I hope you did take the reserve survey uh, Increasing the guarantee, I think that's really important for a couple of reasons. You take a financial hit when you're on reserve, and also the company wouldn't be so, maybe the pad wouldn't be so huge, like 25% if they had to pay more. So thank you, that's an excellent idea. Um, we did vote on the previous contract and it was still pushed through and forced on us. Oh, that contract was the bankruptcy contract. So, you know, that was a different time. Now, there's two, there's, that wasn't a normal negotiations process. What we're in now is the first Section 6 negotiations bargaining session that we've been in for years. And when you come out of mergers and bankruptcies, you, that contract was based on smashing two contracts together in a very short amount of time. So those negotiators did not have a lot of time to decide what to keep in and what to keep out. And they, they put two contracts together that don't necessarily work together. Some of the provisions don't work together. So we have a big road ahead of us. We have a big job, but I guarantee you this time is going to be different because it is a different time and it's going to be a different contract. Um, how do you feel about monthly dues being the equivalent of one hour's work? Example, $28 for new hires and I don't know where they got, but 74 for uh, 13 plus years. Wait, wait, can you rephrase that again? Uh, how do you feel about monthly dues being a, the equivalent of one hour's work? Oh, well, that's up to the budget committee has come up with a lot of different ideas. I mean, that would be an idea in the future. And I think that's that's probably a reasonable idea. I'm sure some unions do that. I think some unions do percentage of their of their pay and other unions. Um, they're based on aggregates of the whole union. For instance, if they have a if there are two unions put together, sometimes they're based on an average of the whole union. So that's how they do it. It's just different. But that's not a bad idea. Um, we okay. are at the 30 minute mark. Uh, we thank everyone for tuning in. This 30 minutes is gone already? Yeah. Well, I want to do this again sometime. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. I hope you got your questions answered. If not, you know, you can always email me. That might take longer to get your answer, but I appreciate you stopping in today because that tells me that you're interested and that you're interested in your union. And uh, have a great evening. And if you're flying, fly safe. Thank you.